it's a, the greatest pleasure for me to introduce Wolfram Siller from the University of Pennsylvania. He has spent a long time here in Brazil. He even speaks Portuguese, so you can talk to him in Portuguese if you want. So he's going to talk about Finsler metrics, uh, closed geodesics, and geodesics flow. Thank you very much. Um, so I also came to Brazil for the first time 15 years ago with Burkhardt. Went to uh, Goiania and uh, um, Brasilia. Sorry. And Rio. And I've been back many times since then. So it's a real pleasure to give a talk here in Sao Paulo. Excuse me. Ah, there you go. Um, okay, so... Uh, First, I should say that this is a joint work with uh, Robert Bind, Patrick Foulon, and uh, um, Zary Ivanov, and Vladimir Matveyev. Um, so, first, I should maybe say that, uh, um, well, before Perelman became famous, he gave a talk at Penn. Uh, this was when he still had long fingernails, right? And uh, what he put on the blackboard was a letter X. And this was the only thing on the blackboard the rest of the talk. <laughs> um, well, X was a manifold, of course. For me, the manifolds are M and not X. Um, I'll write down a little bit more on the blackboard. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a, a conversation about closed geodesics. Uh, so this is a subject that's close to my heart. I started in uh, this subject, proved existence and stability properties of closed geodesics. Um, so the method in that subject is uh, mainly variational theory of the energy function on the free loop space. Closed geodesics are a critical point of this energy function, and one can try to use the topology of the, few, of the free loop space to produce critical points of the energy function. Uh, probably the oldest conjecture is that uh, every comp for every compact manifold, every metric has infinitely many closed geodesics. And that conjecture is still open, although by now one knows that this is true, except possibly in the case where the homology looks like that of a sphere of projective space. So for a sphere of general dimensions, one still only knows the existence of one, except for dimension two, where um, Bernard and, uh, and Franks proved that every metric has infinitely many. So the methods one uses, uh, variation calculus, they work in a more general context in a very natural way. So if one looks at, say, Hamiltonian systems and tries to write down the variation problem for the shorter curves, it's well behaved when uh, the metric is a Finsler metric. So what's a Finsler metric? It's something where in each tangent space, the unit sphere is a strictly convex body, which contains the origin also, but it doesn't have to be symmetric. So a unit sphere can look like uh, um, some convex body, the origin can be over here. So the metric doesn't, a length of V doesn't have to be length of minus V. In fact, in many applications, that isn't in the case, that these are not symmetric. But uh, since the uh, unit sphere is strictly convex, uh, geodesics have uh, the same kind of properties as in Humanian geometry. They are log locally shortest connections. Um, the uh, variational theory on the free loop space works in the same way. It's a well-behaved variational problem. And most of the theorems in uh, Riemannian geometry for the existence of Finsler matrix, uh, for existence of closed geodesics on the Riemannian manifold, carry over with more or less the same proof also in Finsler geometry, except for the uh, result in dimension two that I mentioned. Um, since that's a combination of variational theory and the dynamics of the geodesic flow, 
and that's not known uh, whether on the two sphere they are infinitely many. In fact, when I worked on this subject, uh, I went to Penn State and gave a talk on this subject, and then Katok pointed out to me that in the 70s he produced an example on the two sphere, a fin cinematic on the two sphere, which has only two closed geodesics. So I found that uh, fascinating and I started uh, studying this example. I wanted to see how can you build up the topology of the free loop space with only two closed geodesics. Um, and in particular, uh, why should there be a reason that there should exist more than two in the Romanian geometry, in the four Romanian metric? So let me start out with uh, describing that example because that will again be important for us uh, during the rest of the talk. So Kartok example is in dimension two, all of this works in general dimensions. I start, let's say, with the Romanian manifold. Uh, with all dresses closed. And by normalizing, I can assume they have a common period. Let's see with common period two pi. So then I assume in addition that there exists a killing vector field. So let's X be killing. With flow, uh, see, Vt. And without loss of generality, I can assume that this is also periodic, that uh, phi 2 pi is equal to entity. If there's this one, I can always choose another one with this property. And now I can trust my fence matrix. I have to declare what the norm of a vector V is in the tangent bundle. And uh, this will be uh, the norm with respect to the remaining um, product plus in a prop in V and X in the remaining inner product. Okay. So this is not symmetric. Right? The vector lens of V is not equal to minus V. In fact, if I want to draw the picture, I start with a round sphere. So this is back in the tangent space at every point. I start with a round sphere, and the effect is that X moves the origin. Right? So the origin, if this is a vector X here, the origin is over here. Um, and uh, I'm going to put my number alpha in front of it, so I want to have a one-parameter family of such fin uh which I, I put the alpha right here. And you see I by that is useful. So I'm fixing x, but then I'm changing the, the amount that I move the origin in the unit sphere in this picture. So this here is f inverse of 1 in the tangent space. So a convex body. It's a Finsler metric. You can think, for example, as X being some kind of velocity vector field, maybe of a river or of wind, and you travel in a rowboat or an airplane. Right? Uh, here it's important that uh, uh, alpha is not too large, otherwise the origin moves outside. Certainly, so have to assume that alpha is less than one, then it's still a Finsler metric. Um, Indeed, if you say travel in a river and you want to go from one side to the other side of, of the river with a rowboat, then this can always be done as long as uh, x, which is the velocity of your river, is not too large. You need to have to check that at every point for the water, the origin lies inside the unit sphere. If that's the case, I can go from any point of one side to any point of the other side. If the velocity is too large, of course, you're in trouble. So if you roll, check that the origin is inside the unit sphere. <laughs> okay, so what, do the, what properties does this, does this uh, uh, metric have? Let's maybe uh, look at a special example. So let's do this for a two sphere. And x is uh, dd phi in polar coordinates. So I'm rotating around the north and south pole, right? And then what do the geodesics in this new metric look like? I claim that the following form, the other form t goes to, uh, so I rotate with alpha t, because alpha is in front of the killing vector field x here. 
apply to gamma of t, where gamma of t is a geodesic in G0. In fact, this is a general statement, so in this general setup, that's always true, because the Killing vector field uh, uh, has a flow that acts by symmetries, there's always a geodesics, and then it's not hard to see that uh, geodesics are of this form. So in the two sphere, I can draw a nice picture. Right? I just travel along great circles, and uh, at the same time as I travel, I rotate. Where's the eraser for this blackboard? Here. I start rotating around the north and south pole at a constant speed, or a constant angle alpha. So I'm, I'm here, say, and I travel in this direction by rotating. I follow the wind, if you want to. Right. So now notice that the behavior of, this, uh, of the geodesic flow on this two-sphere depends on the value of alpha, uh, the, the rotation right here. So this rotates by alpha times t. So whether alpha is rational or not is important. Say so if alpha is irrational, what does that mean? That means if I start at a longitude, I go along the rate circle, I come back to the longitude, but do the shift of angle 2 pi alpha. That means it doesn't close up. So it means that the only two closures are on the equator. So in this situation, I have only two closed geodesics on the equator. And then you compute the length very easily. The length is 2 pi over 1 minus alpha, plus or minus alpha, depending on whether I travel with the, with the wind around the equator or against it. Okay. So notice, uh, so uh, uh, say if alpha goes towards 1, the behavior is that uh, one close, close stress goes towards length pi, the other one bundles off to infinity. The energy function for this uh, uh, mass function is a mass bot function. So one can study the behavior of the critical points. It's not mass bot. And one can actually see very nicely what kind of cancellations must take place in the free loop space in order to generate the homology. And in this case here, it says that in the free, free loop space, up to any type I want to, I can generate all the homology with a single closed geodesic. Okay. And you can see how it does that. But somewhere, eventually, a second one appears. So the, this example was, was very interesting for me. I was very excited to do various computations. You can compute the Poincaré map, the index, and all kinds of properties. So the case I'm interested in today is actually the case where alpha is rational, which is interesting also for different reasons. So if alpha is p over q, so here I'm traveling at speed alpha, right, along the closed geodesics, that means that all geodesics are closed. of common length, 2 pi over q, 2 pi, 2 pi q. Right, if we travel along here after 2 pi q and t is 2, 2 pi q, then I end up uh, at the same point. So they all have a, have a common period, but they are exceptional ones. Uh, but there are two exceptional close geodesics. In fact, at the same length there, so 2 pi over what, 1 plus or minus alpha, in this case would be 2 pi uh, q, that's a common period, divided by p, and 2 pi q divided by uh, p minus q. p is bigger, so remember alpha is small equal to 1. So these are the two exception closed geodesics. Only that phenomenon is interesting because in the Riemannian setting, if you have a metric on this two with all geodesics closed, they have a common period. There are no exception closed geodesics due to the theorem of uh, Gorenko model. So this is different in the Finster setting, at least when the Finster metric is, uh, is non-symmetric. Okay, so this was a story that I studied in the 1980s and uh, uh, what is uh, 
uh, new that was discovered eventually is the following property that in the setup here, that uh, the curvature of F alpha is the same as the curvature of F, of F zero. So here, I don't even, so the, the, this is due to the fact that X is killing. I don't even need this condition. It has nothing to do with closed physics. And this was, uh, I think, uh, in this generality first observed by Foulon. In fact, he gave an ICM talk in 2004. And uh, I think one of his interests was that you can also start, for example, with the Fubini Studi metric on CPM. You're killing the form with some killing vector field, and the metric is one quarter pinched and stays one quarter pinched for this Finster deformation. So there's no uniqueness of one quarter pinched metrics on CPN in the realm of Finster metrics, at least non symmetric Finster metrics. I think it's not known whether this is true for symmetric ones. So this, this property is now particularly uh, interesting. So if, uh, if F0 has curvature equal to 1, then also F alpha. So unlike the Nguyen case, there are families of curvature 1 in the Finster metric, which are not uh, a standard. Um, this was a long-standing open problem, whether every Finster metric of constant curvature is Humanian. This is not the case. And then uh, over the last uh, maybe 10 years or so, Robert Bryan uh, wrote a sequence of papers with many examples of this type. In particular, the space of such metrics is infinite dimensional. There are lots of such examples. Okay. Um, especially in dimension two. So these are very nice papers. Um, and the question is, what can one say about these metrics? What do they have in common? Can one say something about the geometry? So one of the theorems that I want to explain a little bit today is the, is the following. Where is my... The other one went away. Okay. If I lose this one, I'm in trouble. Okay, so here's the funny theorem. So if uh, F is a Finster metric on S2, with curvature constant equal to 1, um, then the conclusion is uh, then the Jurassic flow. of F is determined by the length of the close, or the shortest closed Jurassic So by the Jurassic flow here, I mean that I have my flow GT from the tangent bundle to the tangent bundle which takes the tangent vector of the Jurassic at time zero into the tangent vector at time t. So that's called the Jurassic flow. And by determined, I mean that if I have two fin semantics like this with the same uh, smallest lengths, then there's a diffeomorphism with another tangent bundle that takes one to the other. So unique up to conjugacy. Okay. Although uh, one should add that this is not quite as uh, strong as one might think because the diffeomorphism does not descend to the manifold. So I'm not saying that all geodesics on the manifold behaves exactly the same. I'm only saying the geodesic flow on the tangent bundle is the same. So a certain kind of uh, uniform property among all these metrics that they share, in particular, each such metric has Jurassic flow conjugate to a Cartrack metric. So 
the one I discussed before, right? Mate of this type here. They are the lengths of the cross traces by 2 pi divided by plus or minus alpha. So the shortest one determines uh, the, the cartridge metric. And therefore, as a corollary of this, if you want a corollary of this theorem, is that, well, then they all look like Cartog metrics, at least as far as the Jurassic flow on the, on the tangent bundle is concerned. Although the geometry itself uh, can, be, can be quite different, and that's what I want to explain. So the geometry on the manifold itself can be quite different. So let's see. So what does it take to determine the Jurassic flow? Let me really start with that. Less than you might think. Um, so what I'm trying to say is this really is a theorem about closed geodesics. That's the main interest. And I want to explain some of the ideas how to control the lengths of the closed geodesics in order to prove this theorem. So the Jurassic flow now, so we're on the two-sphere, right? Jurassic flow uh, goes from the tangent bundle to the tangent bundle. So that's a tangent bundle of S2. I can go from the unit tangent bundle to the unit tangent bundle, and the unit tangent bundle of S2 is RP3. Okay. So it's an action by the real line, if you want to, on the unit on RP3. Okay. And such actions are classified. They are, up to conjugacy, linear actions. In the following sense, uh, if I describe as, say, a point uh, x, y, inside S3, inside C plus C, um, in R4. I want to claim that the action on RP3 is induced by a linear action on S3. It's going to write down the action on S3. It takes XY to uh, e to the I A theta X, e to the I B theta Y. And B are real numbers. So the Jurassic flow is conjugate to this kind of uh, linear flow, and now can descend to RP3 also. That's what it has to look like up to conjugacy. So how can we determine uh, the integers A and B? That's the question. Where does a, in the geometry of the Finsler metric, how can I recognize the integers A and B? There are again two cases similar to our discussion over here. If A or B is uh, irrational, then uh, this generates a two torus. So I get a two torus action on RP3, and those are unique. That's, it's a Kung G1 action, it's unique, and one can recover in this Kung G1 action the Jurassic flow, which is now something of a certain slope, slope in this two torus. So this case uh, is the easy one, and corresponds to the case that in this case these Jurassics are not all closed. Going through uh, x, comma, 0, and going through 0, comma, y, they are of course closed, but generically they're not closed. If it's rational, that's again the interesting case. So then uh, these stresses all close up. In fact, they have a common period, 2 pi. And exception periods are 2 pi over A in this coordinate and 2 pi over B in the other coordinate. So this means that uh, such a fin cinematic in the setup can only have at most two exceptional closed geodesics. Okay. Um, the case where not all geodesics are closed, like in the fin cinematic when the parameter was irrational, we already dealt with, with this argument that, well, in that case, this is just a two torus action. But if it's rational, I'm in a situation where all geodesics are closed. And now I want to control the length of the exceptional GSX. That's the goal. Right? And according to this, it says that, well, if I know the length of the shortest one, then I should know the length of the other one also, and I should somewhat determine it geometrically. So that's a challenge. Right? So it's really a theorem about closed GSX. 
So we know they exist, we know that the, that the period is what we want to know, but I have to compute the period geometrically. Okay. So how do we do this? I think I don't need this anymore. So the most basic property in the geometry of this, uh, such a manifold is the following. Um, so Jurassics, as I mentioned, have the same kind of behavior. Jaguar fields also do have the same behavior. Since the curvature is one, a Jaguar field along the Jurassic will be sine times a parallel vector field. Okay. Particular it vanishes at time pi again. Every Jaguar field vanishes at time pi if you start at zero. So that means if we look at the exponential map at some point, and I restrict to the sphere of radius pi around the origin, well, all Jacobi's have vanished at time pi, so therefore the derivative of the exponential map is zero at this point, so it must be another point. Let me call it psi of p. So I have a certain map, Psi, which tells you if I start at a point P, every Jurassic of length Pi ends up in the same point Psi of P. Okay. This implies, for example, or easily that if Pi 1 is 0, that M is diffeomorphic to the sphere. By restricting the exponential map to a unit ball and then closing it up to a sphere. Okay. So these are matrix on spheres. Okay. So this map psi, this encodes uh, uh, a lot of information about the geometry. So let's call it MN again. Um, so maybe what's some, some property, say for every Jurassic uh, gamma, psi of gamma of t is gamma of t plus pi. Since every Jurassic at time pi returns to the same point. So psi translates the, all the Jurassics uh, by time pi. Uh, so we assume that all these are closed, but of course we don't know the period. So we don't know when we come back to the point. Um, first observation is that psi is an isometry. So that's a very simple argument. Let me explain that to you. Take two points x and y, connect by a minimum Jurassic, of real faults of Hinsler matrix. Uh, that has distance r, say. r is less than pi because all Jurassics uh, now minimize up to pi. That's another property. All Jurassics minimize up to pi. Because the exponential map induces diffeomorphism on the ball. That means that uh, certainly they have no conjugate points, but better than that, they can't meet. Because otherwise, this, this would not induce a diffeomorphism with a unit sphere. And of course, after pair, they won't minimize anymore because that's a conjugate point along every Jurassic. Uh, so now I can just go on along the same Jurassic. So say here is uh, psi of x. Well, what's pi of x? It's simply gamma at pi, if this point is gamma at zero. Then I end up somewhere at psi of y. But that's gamma of uh, r plus pi, because this is here as gamma at r. Well, that means that along this Jurassic, I go time r along this Jurassic. Okay. But all GSs are minimizing up to time pi. And this r was less than pi, so it's again minimizing. So this is from psi of x to psi of y is again equal to r. So it's an isometry. Right? And this isometry is very important. So I can maybe draw a little bit of a picture. It doesn't tell you everything, it tells you a few properties that you can try to use. So we're under two sphere, right? So remember in the theorem, we're going to assume that n is equal to two. Although for this uh, general story is true in any dimension, right? That's an assumption in any dimension. So in n equal to two, uh, I then have this, this kind of picture, roughly. 
I have my two sphere. If I start anywhere at a point x, I end up at some point psi of x for every Jurassic starting at x. What it does in, be in between, there's no information. Right? It could do anything in between. But it has to end up at the same point psi of x. Okay. Of course, this can't happen. It can't have self-intersections because it's minimizing. So this is a, not a good picture. But it could certainly do the same. Okay. And uh, unlike for the cut example, there's no reason why some equator should be a closed Jurassic. Right? I don't know. And remember, the goal is that, uh, well, we have a common period. Common period means that uh, uh, Psi to some power is the identity. So all closed Jurassic have length uh, uh, 2 pi P, because Psi goes from, has length pi, P times that has length uh, uh, pi times p. Um, well, uh, I can say a little bit more. This assumptive c must be uh, also orientation reversing, right? So if I think of the assumptive, it take us from x to psi of x. What does it do to the orientation? Take a Jurassic and a Jacobi field. It goes to psi of x, and then they cross. Then they cross. So orientation is reversed. So actually, this must be even. Um, okay, so that's my common period, and then we have to somehow determine the lengths of the exception ones. And I know nothing in between, so this is a priori not so easy yet. Okay, so what can one do in dimension two that's special? Um, there, in dimension two, we have a, um, so from the Uniformization theorem, it follows that every compact group acting on S2 is conjugate to a linear action again. So I can assume that psi is linear, but reverse orientation. So it says there exist polar coordinates. And I'm going to keep mixing up these. <laughs> there exist polar coordinates. So somewhere, right? Say th theta and uh, phi, such that uh, psi of uh, theta phi is equal to minus theta, because it has to reverse your orientation. But then there's a shift in phi. So phi plus, uh, say, 2 pi lambda or lambda is some real number. I, I could assume I change the orientation possibly that it lies between zero and one half. Okay. So now I can draw a little bit better picture uh, over there. So a little bit, little bit, I know a little bit more now because there are polar coordinates. So then, uh, um, for example, it goes from the upper hemisphere to the lower one, if you want. So here's theta equal to zero. If I start here, psi of x down here. But I know nothing again in between. If I start on the North Pole, then psi of x is the South Pole. And notice that what this says is that what happens if I keep iterating. Um, so I go from South Pole to North Pole, and then I come back to South Pole, after 10 pi, in fact. So here's pi, I go from North Pole to South Pole, I continue, I come back to the North Pole at time pi. But because of the angle, the tangent vector has a rotation by 2 pi lambda. So I don't come back to the, itself, it's not a closed Jurassic, uh, but it may bounce back and forth between North and South Pole many times until it closes up to time 2 pi p. So it's part of the geometry. And the Jurassic's in between, I don't, don't go through North and South Pole, may be embedded or not. Right. Okay, so that's uh, uh, our first improvement in dimension two, that I know what the uh, normal form of the assumptions is. So we're going to use that strongly. And uh, what I want to prove is the following. 
because it's a very nice geometric proof. So every exceptional Jurassic, so that means length uh, less than, uh, what was it, 2 pi p, prime length less than 2 pi p, I call this exceptional, just like in the Cartog metric, is embedded. I like the dress is going from North Pole to South Pole and have the following property. And uh, two possibilities. A, it has lengths uh, um, um, pi over lambda with W equal to 1. And B is uh, it has lengths uh, pi over uh, 1 minus lambda with W equal to minus 1. So your W is a winding number. Around North and South Pole. Okay. It's embedded. That means it can't go through North and South Pole because these are clearly not embedded. So it has to lie somewhere in between without ever hitting North and South Pole. But it says that the exceptional ones, they rotate once around North and South Pole, but uh, in opposite directions. So the one that has someone looks like this, then there's another one, I don't know where it lies, so somewhere like this. Okay. It's embedded at least, and one winds around this way, and one winds around the other way. Where was it? Okay. Notice that in this situation here, a Jurassic going the other way around is not a Jurassic anymore because the metric is not uh, symmetric. Okay. It could happen indeed that these uh, two closed Jurassic coincide in the image, like in the Carter example, where it's just the equator, but they're different. They count differently because their length differs. Okay. Um, okay. Um, let's see. So I want to say that, oh, okay over here. So there are two possible lengths that are allowed. So I, I'm now saying only what the allowed lengths are. Pi over lambda and pi over 1 minus lambda. So pi over lambda would be, um, let's see, we assume lambda is rational. Right? So lambda is uh, uh, 2 pi p is a common period. So 2 q over p. Right, this would mean the common period is 2 pi p. And uh, then what is uh, pi over lambda? That is uh, 2 q pi over p. And the other one, pi over 1 minus lambda, is 2 q pi over 2 q minus p, I guess. So these are the exception lengths here, divide by p. p could be equal to 1, so this uh, one could also be not exceptional. But this here is a short one, and this, uh, this cannot be not exceptional. There must at least be one exceptional close to ASIC. Unless, uh, maybe I should, unless the lambda is equal to 1 half, that's a special situation, then p is goes the entity. Then I have a simple situation where I start at a point. I go to psi of x. I continue. I come back at time 2 pi. So all close Jurassic have the same prime length 2 pi then. Okay. If you think of the circle actions on the RP3, that means it's simply conjugate to the Hopf fraction. The Jurassic flow in that situation conjugate to the Hopf fraction. But there are many examples of this type uh, that Robert Bryan produced. This already is infinite dimensional finstamatic with this property, with all Jurassic's uh, prime closed or length 2 pi. Okay. So now let's see how we can control this length. I think that's one uh, nice part of the proof with the picture. So let's take an exception close to ASIC. So 
I'm not going to show you why it's embedded. That's part of the proof here. So one has to show this first. Right, this closed stress is embedded. I take a point on this closed stress. It's called x0. And now look at all the images under this asymptotic C of the point x0. Okay. Uh, they will be distributed somewhere along the circle in an even fashion. So here's x1, x2. This may not be Psi of x0. But then can come back and many times. But at some point, they call it xm, which is psi of x0. It has to occur somewhere along this Jurassic. Now continue, possibly, always with the same distance. And here say is xn minus 1, and this is xn. So the n points along this closed Jurassic, which are images under the asymptotic psi, Particularly each segment, so if gamma, gamma i is a segment, say, from xi to xi plus 1, they are the same lengths. And what's important for us is that the change in the angle phi here, going around the angle in this direction, must be the same. So I claim the change of phi is the same along all segments. Just because they have somatity that takes one to the other, and their somatity preserves this kind of uh, special polar coordinates, which one has to see, and that's not hard. So therefore, this picture is bad, right? The angle change is also the same from point to point. Let's call that A. So what does that mean? It means that if I go to XM, so the angle change, uh, so m times a, so here I go up to time pi, right? so m times a is, uh, is what? Well, um, how do you know the address is embedded? It goes around north and south pole, right? Uh, so the total angle change must be, uh, must be 2 pi, 2 pi lambda, not 2 pi. Well, because along the closed Jurassic, eventually I close up again at 2 pi lambda. Um, so I have a relationship between my lambda, my, my lambda, angle lambda, that uh, in some sense is an invariant of the fin metric. I call it the rotation angle, because it tells you how much you rotate in the phi coordinate. Right? So this rotation angle lambda is related to the change in the phi angle. So, uh, let's see. Well, I forgot. Uh, um. Sorry, what is your M? My M is the first time I hit the image of X0 on the assumptive psi. Okay. And M is the number of distinct points that I have on the closed Jurassic. Okay. So I have to also bring in the winding number. Let's see. Ah, okay, of course this is not correct. It's uh, 2 pi w uh, mod 2 pi, right? So I go around the closed Jurassic. It winds uh, uh, once around uh, the north and south pole. It cannot, not a one, not wind around. W can't be zero, because then the change in angle would be zero. But the change in angle is m times the number a, which can't be zero. This also implies that I either go uh, around in one direction or the other direction. Okay, and this will influence this inequality. On the other hand, what's the change in angle from x0 to xm? which was the image of x0 on the asymmetry, this is then m times a, because along one segment it was equal to a. Right? And this here consists of m segments. So, um, did I do this right? Uh -huh. There's one integer that's not correct. Uh, this should be n. Right? I want to go around the whole cluster Jurassic. It consists of n segments, right? Each time I change by an angle a 
along each segment. In fact, this end times, I go on the whole cross Jurassic, but it's embedded, so the winding number is plus or minus one, so it's either two pi or minus two pi, depending on which run, which way run I go. So the change from x0 to xm is n times a, and this is equal to uh, um, so m times 2 pi w over n. Okay. So, of course, I'm going distance pi from x0 to xm. That's not information I have. So, uh, what does that mean? That means that uh, um, the number m times a, so that's a m times, I go from here to here. Well, that's distance equal to pi. So, uh, I must go along this, uh, along this uh, Jurassic up to C. So, that means that m over n times 2 pi w must be either equal to 2 pi lambda, well, either 2 pi lambda or 2 pi. Because this tells you what w was psi does. Psi shifts by 2 pi lambda, the angle, right? And here I go from x0 to xm, that's uh, distance uh, pi, so this must be, uh, the psi must exact shift the angle by 2 pi lambda. So now I can look uh, at two cases, so what does this mean? So two possibilities. Um, one would be that uh, uh, m, over, m over n times w is equal to uh, uh, lambda. That means w is equal to plus one. So I go clockwise around it. Uh, and then what's the length of the Jurassic gamma? Well, each segment has the same length, right? What's the length of the first segment? Up to here it's pi. So the first segment, segment is length pi over m. So length of gamma is n times pi over m. Right, from here to here it's pi. From here to here it's pi over m. I do this n times. So it's n times pi over m. So that means, let's put it together, that's equal to uh, pi over lambda. Okay, so that's one possibility here, pi over lambda with value number plus one. Okay, there's one more case which I won't carry out now is that it could be that m over n times w is equal to one minus lambda, so it could be negative, then w is minus one, goes around the other way, and then you can compute the length, it's pi over minus lambda. So that's the proof. So you just look at the action of, of the isomity psi along the embedded closed J6. Okay. You're not done yet because this only says that uh, there are two possible exception lengths. I'm not saying that this exists or this exists, um, but I have to argue now that there exist exception ones, and if they are, then they have to have one of these two lengths. Okay. Notice the uh, pi over n minus lambda is the shortest one. And in fact, it has a length uh, less than 2 pi, but bigger than pi. Less than 2 pi because lambda is less than 1 half. And uh, um, so that's the, the length of the shortest one. Right? and bigger than pi since every Jurassic minimum is up to pi. So it's a short one, has length less than two pi. And this one might be very long, depending on the rational number. So let's see, how, how can I produce such close Jurassics? So the standard argument in, in Humanian geometry, which works the same in Finster geometry, that uh, one looks at uh, what I call displacement Jurassics of isometries. So what is that? So let's say I have an isometry uh, of my Finsler metric or Riemannian metric such that it has no fixed points for all x and such has a finite order. 
Let's say K. Then I claim there's an, a closed Jurassic, which is invariant idea of geometry, which I want to call the displacement Jurassic. So what's the argument? Looks at distance from X to F of X. Well, this number is positive since I know a fixed point. M is compact, so it assumes a minimum. Let that minimum be X0. So that's the distance from X0 to F of X0. So I'll go from X0 to F of X0 with, with some minimum Jurassic. And I'll continue, and I claim it can continue this way because then the image, f of gamma, would have an angle right here. If it had an angle, then going from midpoint to midpoint would be shorter than distance from x0 to this point here. Right? So this plus this would be shorter. So the angle, if I continue, if I translate gamma to the next f of gamma, it can't have an angle. So the picture is uh, here's gamma, here's f of gamma, the square of gamma, and so on. And since it has finite order, I come back with uh, f k minus one of gamma, and it closes up. Okay. So it's a displacement uh, Jurassic of an isometry. So we can try to apply this idea to the isometries we have, and the only one is psi or its powers. Okay. So let me just produce one in the last five minutes, maybe the shortest one, which is supposed to be this one right here, which has a certain geometric meaning. So let's look at the minimal displacement Jurassic in the sense over there of the isometry psi inverse. So I go, don't take psi itself, I take psi inverse. This is uh, better in the following sense. So now I minimize the distance from x to psi inverse of x. So let's take our point x and take psi inverse of x. Let's say this distance is d of this displacement Jurassic. You can argue also argue it must be less than pi. Uh, and now I can continue. So now I can go up to pi, say. So this here is uh, um, psi of x. Um, so that is now, um, sorry, let me do it like this. What is psi of this point right here? So let's continue here up to psi or psi inverse x, but that's x. So I must come back to x at time pi. So I go from x to psi of inverse of x, that's a small distance. I now continue up to time pi from this point. Since I've taken the displacement Jurassic of psi inverse, I come back to x itself. And this distance by, def by the def definition of psi is distance pi. Okay, this is a closed Jurassic gamma. of uh, length d plus pi, which is less than 2 pi. So it's exceptional. I remember the common period was 2 pi times an integer. This is a short closed Jurassic, must be exceptional because the length is less than pi. And according to our theorem, its length must be pi by 1 minus lambda. Notice that already I recovered the number lambda from the shortest closed Jurassic. It's because I know it's length now that determines lambda. Um, the second closed Jurassic, if it exists, would have length pi over lambda. Uh, so we're almost done with the theorem. Okay. Um, I want to find a second closed Jurassic, if it exists, which has these longer lengths, which has pi over lambda. Right? That's a long one. So here what I can do, I can look now at displacement Jurassic of powers of psi. Each one has a displacement Jurassic. You have to be careful. You have to choose a case such that uh, it doesn't have a fixed point. That's one condition. It has finite order by definition. And you have to choose k such that it's not equal to psi inverse. Of course, you already found that one. 
You also have to show along the way that the dispersion justifier psi-in was unique. Right? That's also part of the claim. So then I, I look at various powers and I convince myself eventually for a large K I can choose it such that all these properties are satisfied and then I get a closed Jurassic which, uh, which is not equal to the special Jurassic gamma zero here. That's the second way of myself length uh, pi over one minus lambda and then I'm done according to my general discussion that there can be at most two exceptional closed Jurassics. So I determine them and I know what the length is. If you want a picture, that's kind of neat. What does this first Jurassic look like? The displacement Jurassic of Psi inverse. Well, the distance from uh, X to Psi inverse of X. It's now symmetry. It's a distance of Psi of X uh, to X. I minimize that, right? That's my, and then I take a Jurassic that connects them. So I minimize the distance from Psi of X to X. So what does that mean? Here's my point X. I go to Psi of X for some Jurassic as length pi. Now I want to go backward. So in general there would be some very short one but would have an angle there. This length would be less than pi. And now I simply minimize that among all points X. So I want to minimize the return time going from psi of x back to x. When you minimize the return time, the effect is that this angle is going to be equal to pi, and then it closes up and has this length less than 2 pi. So that's in a, another part of the picture. Um, there are other details left which I'm not going to discuss, uh, so thank you. Questions? Find that number different from two. No, I don't know one. I assume they exist, but uh, uh, so, the, so the examples find many are these kind of car top type examples. I can also say start with one of these uh, Bryant metrics where all these are close or lengths two pi, which have a killing vector field. Deform that, then I get uh, say by an irrational multiple times a killing vector field. I get again only two cross Jurassics. So I have many examples of only two, but I don't know one where it's finite and, uh, and bigger than two. That's a good question. Uh, where are you there? Problem for you. Are you sleeping? <laughs> Any more questions? So the injectivity rate is equal to diameter, right? All, all just minis, minimize up to pi, not beyond that. So it's the same. So it's a Blaschke manifold, but it's not isometric to a round sphere. So it's again a counterexample to Blaschke in the Finsler realm. Hmm. More questions? I have one since the second second of your talk. So <laughs> when you said that. You, you have the Finsler metric in dimension n, you said, that you, you deform it, the Catoc metric, actually. Uh, you said that it also has curvature one. So, curvature in which sense? This is a Finsler metric, right? Uh, okay, so that's, uh, I swept that under the carpet. So uh, um, one thing that's special about Finsler metrics, so my uh, unit sphere is a convex body, here's the origin, that means that all the geometry is directionally dependent. Right, so in this direction and this direction, the geometry must be very different, okay. That means that various other objects are directionally dependent. In particular, if I want to look at the kind of section curvature I used to, it must depend on not only the two-plane, but also a vector inside the two-plane. So it's called flag curvature. For example, I take a Jurassic, that's my one vector, I look at some uh, transfer to it, that's my two-plane, but it will also depend on the direction of the Jurassic. 
So it's a curvature, it's a flag curvature. For each flag, I have a number, and this, in, this theorem should be equal to one for any flag. Okay. More questions? So thank you very much, Wolfgang.